So I'm going to be giving you first an overview of the book as a whole, and then focusing in on specifically on the issues of diversity and how diversity is a networked process, but that also gets conventionalized through particular policy processes that, that try to standardize it. Um, but so first, I'd like to set the scene a bit with um, some and introduce you to some of the people that I have worked with. So in the summer of 2005, uh, I first visited Anta at Zemitis Farm in Northeast Latvia. After introducing her farm's activities, she said, when you go to the upper meadows, you'll see why this place is special. It's something you have to feel. Anta began grazing wild horses on 50 hectares of her land in these upper meadows as a way to care for grasslands, which she had obtained from a neighboring abandoned farm. She collects medicinal plants and wildflowers from these meadows uh, and, and the mosaic grasslands that have emerged through the grazing of the wild horses, which she uses in teas and herbal sauna procedures, uh, and to supplement the income that she gets from her other farm activities of raising beef cattle, sheep, and vegetable production. The farm's relationship with horses uh, thus mediated a set of new social relationships and networks on her farm, which brought the farmer together with the horses, plants, visitors, craftspeople, and many others who, who came through. A few months later, on the other side of the world, I met Pablo in Costa Rica, a retired school biology teacher who had started a project 15 years ago to save native seeds that he felt were being lost as family seed exchange networks were being broken down with the rise of commodity uh, agricultural production. When I visited his hilly farm in, central, in the Central Valley in 2009, he showed me numerous varieties of beans, corn, roots, and tubers that he had saved. A core group of these were from uh, his family and ancestral networks from parents and grandparents. Others he had received in new seed exchanges with other organic farmers. These old and new seed exchanges came together when he crossed a native yellow diamond variety, which he'd had from his parents, with red and purple varieties that he obtained from uh, from Guanacaste, uh, from lowland farmers in Guanacaste, uh, to create these resplendent multicolored varieties, which he called the Zemia effect, uh, for the pollen effects that it, that it displayed. These seed exchange practices influenced both the genetic diversity of the Creole seeds, or Semias criollas, uh, that he managed, but also the structure of the farmer's social network through which they were exchanged. So over a decade of field work that I did with organic farmers in both Latvia and Costa Rica, I watched them navigate contradictory pressures which were associated with the harmonization of legislation that was needed, that was necessitated by entry into the European Union and the Central American Free Trade Agreement, or CAFTA. These have often had negative effects on diversity, even when the stated aim was the opposite. So I argue that organic farmers work to protect their cultures and environments through a set of innovative practices, such as the maintenance of these mosaic landscapes and the creolized seeds. Diversity emerges in these networks as they create their farms as unique places from which new relationships with consumers and visitors uh, emerge that go beyond the market. They also contest regulations that threaten to delegitimize or criminalize these most innovative practices in struggles for what I call organic sovereignties. So to say a few more words about sovereignty. The broader argument in the book is about how farmers and their movements in peripheral places negotiate sovereignties at different levels in the face of, of state and superstate uh, governance mechanisms. So on the one hand, organic farmer practices in both countries resonate with calls by food sovereignty movements for the right of nations and peoples to, pr to control their own food systems, including their own markets, production modes, food cultures, and environments. Yet organic agriculture is often presumed to be somehow a marketing issue or a neoliberal tool, uh, which has resulted in the conventionalization of organic agriculture uh, 
whereby the organic sector begins to mirror the conventional agriculture practices and business structures that it once opposed. Yet in my work, what I try to do is explore in what ways and under what conditions organic certification and the way it gets contested actually can serve to test the institutional dilemmas that surround the idea of implementing food sovereignty as a set of practices. For this, we need to understand the term sovereignty beyond the realm of the state. Uh, Robert Latham has suggested that we consider how various actors construct social sovereignties, which he defines as the structures of relations that set the terms for or are constitutive of a domain of social existence. There's also many scholars of indigenous sovereignty uh, that argue that sovereignty is not about autonomy per se, but rather it's the process of making relationships between people which is an intermingling of autonomy and interdependence. So it's interdependence with other groups, with the state, and with other species in the landscape, often, in, in this case. So drawing on these literatures, I explore how certified organic agriculture in these regional peripheries serves to put into place a set of structures and relationships that form these types of social sovereignties. I argue that these organic movements actually use certification as a way to mediate their relationships to their landscapes, markets, state, and superstate, and are negotiating these interstitial spaces of sovereignty in between them. Of course, the more these processes are regulated at the superstate level through regional trade blocks like the EU and CAFTA, uh, the the less farmers' movements are able to actually negotiate these relationships at the local and state levels. So to say a little bit about these places, which I call regional peripheries, free trade is accomplished through the, the concept of harmonization, which sounds very benign and friendly. Um, yet harmonization of national, national legislation is actually a form of creating new power geometries between the more powerful states and the, the ones that are dictating the terms of the international agreements and the smaller ones that, uh, that must implement these. And so it's already a way of constraining sovereignties at, at multiple scales. This is particularly true in countries such as Latvia and Costa Rica, which inhabit the frontiers of these large unions like the European Union and the United States. So these countries are regional peripheries in that they're no longer the second and the third world. They neither classify as developing or developed, um, and they lack both the infrastructure and domestic capital of the global north, yet also lack the development funding of the global south. So they're really these in-between categories, and I think we need to destabilize the sort of north, south, east, west, dichotomies and look at what's happening in the sort of northeast and the southwest, right, of, of these, these geopolitical worlds. So in some ways, these are geopolitical bridges um, between east and west and north and south. And they, they're, of course, tiny countries that are completely insignificant politically in their own right, but strategically, they're important as frontiers for economic and political region building by these greater powers which necessitates the harmonization of domestic legislation so that they will fit these international treaties. Uh, the smaller farmers in these small countries are caught at the intersection of regulations on organic certification on the one hand and a set of new laws on hygiene, intellectual property rights, land management, and a host of others uh, that are brought about, by, brought about by these free trade agreements. Thus, organic farmers in these regional peripheries are actually often unable to sell their products at all, uh, resulting in what they perceive as a set of nested injustices against them. In, even, even while there's this idea that organic farmers are somehow selling out, they can't even sell. <laughs> so Latvian and Costa Rican organic farmers, in my experience, they are negotiating new relationships to the state and the market through their defining themselves as organic. 
And in that, they're pushing the boundaries of what's considered organic agriculture and using these regulatory mechanisms as spaces of struggle uh, for finding these spaces of sovereignty within these governance bodies. And to just say a little bit more about the uh, actual differences between these very historically different places. So it's important to understand both the discursive debates and the material effects of what happens when you form these big free trade regions, um, as well as to explore how they intersect with agrarian histories to influence farmer subjectivities. So in this regard, joining the EU and CAFTA has carried very different symbolic meanings um, in the two countries. So in Latvia, smallholder farms were associated largely with the interwar independence period, and thus, in the post-Soviet era, it was seen as a return to Europe, um, which for many, it felt that it had been severed from Europe by the Soviet occupation from 45 to 91, and so it was a very romanticized dream to return to Europe, and as Eglit has said, return to normality. The hegemony of this narrative, uh, which was compounded by the anti-politic sentiment of the Soviet era, uh, meant that there was almost no debate about joining the EU. This was a completely foregone conclusion, uh, even though farmers in 2003 told me that they were concerned about what EU accession would bring um, for their practices. Uh, but there has been, since joining the EU, uh, uh, a lot more sort of increasing resentment about what's happened. In Costa Rica, in contrast, the issue is very hotly debated on every street corner and in a lot of political cartoons, um, where CAFTA represented, for some, a global development future, and for others, a form of neoliberal neocolonialism. So the, there was a very historic referendum on joining CAFTA which was very narrowly approved in 2007, but the debates about it and the imagined futures that CAFTA represented for these different groups still divide the country today. So in Costa Rica, the smallholder farming was symbolically, it's been associated with the country's long history of democracy, which has made it what's considered an exception within uh, the war-torn Central American context. And both the pro and anti-CAFTA campaigns really tried to take advantage of this and, and show that they were going to continue with this exceptionalism in some way. So the political debates were quite intense. So despite the fact that in Latvia, this entering a free trade region like the EU was considered a return to normality, um, and in Costa Rica, it was meant to be a form of preserving exceptionalism, so you can see these come from very different political subjectivities that farmers have. Um, but in both cases, they actually saw that, the, that a strong role for the state is something that they would need to guarantee their rights and abilities to, to continue for sovereignties, thus not autonomy from the state, but an interdependence with the state in a supported way. So throughout my analysis in the book, um, I identify five key components that make up these struggles for organic sovereignties. Uh, and these include memories of place, networked diversities, autonomies of practice, transformative values, and nested environmental justices. And so each of these I explore in a different chapter of the book. Here I'm only going to draw on examples from two of the chapters um, about network diversities of place that farmers are creating in their farms and landscapes, and how these get conventionalized through these, uh, these harmonization processes. So if we think about diversity, um, Arturo Escobar has asked, uh, does biodiversity exist in a rather controversial way? And he proposed that biodiversity is actually a discourse itself which emerged out of the signing of the Convention of Biological Diversity in 1992. Thus, the CBD uh, represents biodiversity, as Sarah Whit Whatmore has explained, um, in wholly biological terms, and this is a quote, the outcome of an evolutionary process divested of human presence, um, 
divested of human presence. So this type of a definition lends itself to a very, count, very careful accounting of the different types of species and organisms that exist, rather than thinking about the processes and interactions through which that kind of diversity emerges and is maintained. And the increased attention to wild biodiversity through things like the Convention on Biological Diversity simultaneously detracted from attention away from the work that farmers and others have been doing over centuries to create and protect agricultural diversity and associated biodiversity. So we must consider the complex reasons why farmers engage with biodiversity in order to understand and better facilitate its conservation in, in agricultural settings in, in the future. So with the term networked diversities, I'm trying to challenge a bit this decontextualized gene genealogical approach, which leads to just counting of biodiversity, and hope to facilitate a broader and more relational understanding of diversity as, as a set of politics in relation to organic practices, livelihood strategies, and alliances that farmers make with non-humans in their landscapes as well. So following Ingall's relational model that, quote, renders difference not as diversity but as positionality, um, end quote, I am trying to decenter diversity to show how it's an emergent property of networks built by farmers in conjunction with other species. So this becomes a mutual reconstitution of the relationships between humans, non-humans, places, um, and, and can be seen in what Donna Haraway has also talked about in this kind of becoming with of other species, of, of companion species. So returning to Latvia, um, I'll give you some examples of how, how I see this networked diversity coming into place. So Anta introduced the wild horses in her meadows uh, that had not been farmed in over 20 years and were being overtaken by what she called um, a uh, wall of alders. So she kept the human disturbance to a minimum and let the animals form the landscape. The grazing enhanced the biological diversity in the meadows uh, and in the grasslands by preventing the encroachment of low-grade forest species, stimulating the growth of a wide range of vascular plants and protected nesting areas for endangered birds. A fascinating mosaic developed uh, including well-worn paths where the horses walked um, and uneven patches of shrubs intermixed with tightly cropped grasses where, where the animals were grazing. The horses developed a set of new behaviors once they were introduced into these meadows, um, for instance, standing in a circle to protect their young uh, from wolves that would come at night with their back legs facing out to kick away approaching predators. The introduction of wild horses was thus, in a way, a conscious strategy to enlist other partners in caring for the land in, in quantities more than what they could do on their own. They faced a lack of capital and a landscape of abandonment, as many people had left to go work, for instance, in the UK. <laughs> um, and they formed new bonds of cooperation, thus, with these other species in order to recreate and maintain these mosaic meadows and preserving biodiversity in the process. The cooperation with other species also mediated other innovations and other types of social relations on these organic farms, such as the reinvention and revival of the traditional za yupirts, which is this wooden herb, herbal uh, steam sauna, so it's a wood-fired steam sauna, um, where you use the leaves of various trees, herbs, and medicinal plants um, for, for aromatic purposes uh, that, that are collected from these horse grazing meadows. The network diversity on the farms also mediated new economic opportunities. So Anta began employing some local people to help her collect the plants, um, to make some herbal balms and rubs that were used in the, in the sauna procedures, and to also uh, sell some to a local cosmetic company that was starting to sell upscale uh, lotions abroad. Meanwhile, the natural dyed wool from the yarn uh, from her sheep attracted a circle of craftspeople who would knit socks, mittens, and slippers to Anta's guests. So a whole uh, local economy started to emerge around these, uh, these products. <clears throat> 
Organic farmers also created other types of exchange relations with the clients that came to, for example, the pirs for the, for the sauna. One of her former pirs clients became her electrician, another built her fireplace. Uh, so these are not just sort of luxury consumer producer relationships, but they're also a sort of, they mirror previous forms of informal exchange networks that existed in the socialist era where formal networks often didn't exist at all. So the diversification of social networks stemmed from a diversity in the meadows, which became a source of further diversified livelihood options. Diversity both emerged from and connected this network. It's thus, thus noteworthy that these connections out of which diversity has emerged did not happen by conscious design, um, by the agency of one actor or organization, but rather as an almost accidental outgrowth of the way in which Amta combined her traditional cultural practices like the Pirts with new knowledge on grazing wild horses and an ecological sensibility of the landscape which she developed through living there. This is both despite and because of the pressing socioeconomic circumstances in which the farmers found themselves. So she and other farmers would use these innovative integrations of human and non-human cooperation to enrich their organic practices in new ways and to create and maintain these networks' diversities of place. So moving on to Costa Rica. Uh, if the networks' diversities of place from Latvia were embodied in Anta's teas and sauna rituals, the diversity that emerged on Costa Rican farms was largely uh, embodied in the vast array of seeds that farmers managed and through the social connections they formed around their exchange. On Costa Rican farms, seeds were stored in every corner, different types of beans in jars and bowls, corn cobs hanging from, uh, from the rafters in the garage. Most told me that they didn't ever purchase seeds but only exchanged with other farmers. And traditionally, of course, seed exchange had happened within families, uh, but now as brothers and, and uncles were perhaps moving to conventional production, uh, they were forming these new seed exchange networks with, uh, with other, exchange, with other uh, organic farmers. So these seed exchanges had direct connections to and implications for biodiversity because they were promoting a large number of species, varieties, and land races. As the seeds traveled in these exchanges from one climate to another, they also incorporated new traits and adapted to climactic changes and growing conditions. The genetic makeup then is directly linked to and dependent upon the, the social and kin networks through which they're exchanged. And the seeds themselves, much like the farmer's fields, become made up of all of these previous exchanges. In Costa Rica, these seed exchanges were also thus part of what constituted farmers' identity, their practices, and their social relations. The diversity of the seeds and the connections with other farmers were also anchored within these wider um, ecological networks and that included people, plants, pollinators, and spiritual beliefs. Organic farmers spoke of seeds as living creatures that they protected and with whom they collaborated and as accomplices in a chosen way of life. This resonates with, observ with observations from the Andes and elsewhere that farmers can perceive a sense of interspecies co-evolutionary kinship with certain crops. While diversity was sometimes facilitated through these exchange networks, it was also consciously created by farmers. So farmers refer to these seeds as, as semillas criollas or creole seeds. And on Pablo's hilly farm uh, in the Central Valley, he showed me several varieties of maize that he had planted at different times so they wouldn't cross-pollinate. But one was a variety of yellow corn that his parents had made specifically by crossing a land race with a commercial variety, obtained as a sample from an extension agent in the 1980s. So the resulting corn they called uh, yellow 80 semi-dwarf because they received it in 1980. <laughs> um, and they were, uh, it was the resulting mix of this, um, the sweeter taste and the earlier harvest time of the commercial variety with the resistance of the native one. 
Farmers like Pablo were thus creating agrobiodiversity, both by crossing new varieties and selecting strains from populations in their fields, much as farmers have done throughout history. Moreover, the way that, they, that his family managed these seeds incorporated the embodiment of the memories of ancestors and traditional seed practices, along with a somewhat subversive reclaiming of commercial seeds. And in fact, the term creolization is important here because uh, if you think about creole languages, this meant more than just mixing, it was also a political act of um, seizing and re-signifying dominant codes and, a, and implied a critical restructuring. So in Costa Rica, farmers sometimes take the dominant commercial seeds and change them physically by crossing them, but it also thus assigned them new social meanings. So creolization of both the farmer seeds and the social networks act as mutually reinforcing forms of cultural and agricultural resistance. And indeed, the Costa Rican organic movement uh, had a whole campaign against CAFTA based in the idea that they were positioning agroecology as a set of practices as a form of resistance to free trade and within that seed exchange networks. So Costa Rica, uh, in Costa Rica, seed diversity emerged out of the existing networks between farmers and seeds, uh, but they were also a conscious strategy of uh, facing the changes uh, in Costa Rica's socioeconomic circumstances that were affecting uh, farms, farmers' abilities to keep maintaining this diversity. And they were creating these new networks which integrated farmers, seeds, pollinators, and other environmental factors into another type of a networked diversity of place. So uh, to summarize a bit, um, the, the idea of, um, those are some of the, the corn varieties, uh, this idea of networked diversities. The networked diversities of mosaic meadows and of Creole seeds are these layered sets of memories, processes, and relationships that emerge almost inadvertently, or you could say organically, through the practices of the organic farmers. And if we extrapolate from the literature that views landscape as a process and place as an event, then it's possible also to think about diversity as a process. So rather than focusing only on lists of endangered species or threats to ecosystems, if we think about biodiversity as a process, then the networked ecological and cultural practices that contribute to it it's a more dynamic way of understanding the complexity of human actions and interactions with the environment. And on these farms, diversity is relational. So the mosaic meadows and semillas criollas emerge out of the connections that farmers build with other, farms, other farmers and other species, and they're maintained through these interactions and new reconfigurations. We can identify a number of characteristics of the process through which diversity emerges and is maintained. So first, the, they are mutually constituted and interdependent, um, these relationships between the people, plants, and animals. And that's central to the coming into being of diversity in these organic farms. Secondly, the farming practices are born out of a continual adaptation to new circumstances. And diversity thus, er, thus emerges first, maybe as a momentary interaction among species and, and circumstances. Um, but this is not the sort of static and essentialized nationalist biocultural diversity that assumes that every culture has its own, own set ways of being. Rather, these are dynamic and creative means of adapting to changing cultural and political economies within diverse ecologies. Third, diversity breeds more diversity. Uh, so grassland diversity emerges from horses grazing in the meadows, calling into being new socioeconomic relations through the pifts and the teas. The seed diversity that emerges from farmers exchanging seeds from one climactic zone to another create these new networks in the process. And finally, while diversity may emerge out of human, non-human relationships in the landscape, it must be valued by the farmers and be incorporated into their landscapes and networks in order to become integral to these placemaking efforts by the farmers rather than just being a sort of side effect. And conservation efforts that overlook the significance of these networked relationships surrounding diversity may not be effective in the long term 
as they won't reproduce the conditions that motivate farmers to actually engage in these processes. So diversity is not something to be only to be counted and lost, but also something that can be created and maintained. Of course, for this to happen, uh, policies must resonate with cultural memories, place-based ecological knowledge of the present, and the future imaginaries of residents, which is not always the case. Um, so to say a bit more about the, the actual policies that have contested these, uh, these types of um, efforts, in both Latvia and Costa Rica, there were a set of legislative changes which were associated with the harmonization of, of laws uh, that transformed these networked diversities of place into what can be seen as a, as a conventionalization of diversity. So uh, to give just some examples, going back to, uh, the Costa, to, to the Latvian example, after joining the EU, organic farmers had to meet a new set of guidelines which were called the EU Good Environmental and Agricultural Practices Guidelines. These are requirements for receiving EU support payments. And they were directed at uh, mandating either agricultural productivity on one hand or biological diversity. So this was implemented through um, these aerial maps, which would show where, um, which land was eligible for, for payments. And any trees that were, any, any areas that had trees or bushes were considered not active agricultural land because it was seen as um, starting progression towards swamp or forest. So any wetlands, any trees, automatically got excluded from these maps. This type of exclusion uh, created problems for farmers like Anta, who's in her wild horse grazing territory. Uh, there were these uneven cycles, which she explained. So she said, natural grazing is a long-term process. It's not just that in a five-year period, if a tree has been there, that it will stay there. Usually, the animals eat it. They chew off the bark until it finally falls over and dies. Then there is a moment like this one, where the bushes have grown tall, but they will get nibbled off again. They hurry to grow, knowing that their demise is coming. So besides all of the trees that were uh, creating these, these problems in, in the calculation of her land area, there was also a defunct Soviet storage, uh, drainage system on her land. And there, a natural wetland had returned, which had been dammed by the beavers and became a haven for birds in the spring. So all of this messy intermingling of meadows, paths, wetlands, shrubs, trees, made it very difficult to understand where the meadow uh, ends and where the forest begins, and thus was not considered proper farming, according to the EU guidelines. The farmers' more innovative practices uh, were thus seen as illegible, in the words of James Scott, um, to these state and superstate regulations, and they thus were not recognized as being eligible for EU support, despite the fact that these were the very practices through which the farmers had defined themselves as organic and, as being, and their, their farms as unique places. So if the farmers couldn't meet the eligible criteria, eligibility criteria for actively farmed land, they could hope, hope to meet those for biologically valuable grasslands, which were um, monitored through a set of indicator species. Yet there were also contradictions between the type of diversity uh, promoted through that counting of species and the way that farmers imagined their farms. So one difference is specifically the quantification of diversity rather than attention to the processes. For example, uh, farmers, ecologists came and counted the number of species in Anta's fields. So as Tim Ingold has said, you can ask of land how much, but not of a landscape. So a landscape is not quantifiable. And so for her, reducing the processes of the networked diversities and of these landscapes to a list of species on a tourist website also delegitimized a lot of her own uh, relationships in the same way that land was being excluded from her laps, from her from her maps, uh, she also found that there was an incongruence between these different agencies that were asking her of different things. 
And so she said, it's not for nothing that this territory has now been recognized as habitat for both the corn crake and the spotted eagle, but that's not the rural support agency's landscape. So the quantification of diversity can also have effects on how farmers perceive their own value, the, the value of their own land. Another farm, uh, which also had innovative grazing practices and had recently undergone a similar assessment, the farmers told me afterwards um, uh, proudly about the number of species the experts had found. And they said, quote, now we will be smarter and we'll be able to tell others about it. We already knew that we had valuable things here, but we didn't know how to defend our opinion. So now they viewed the ecology's lists of species as the proper language in which to characterize their farm, replacing the socio-ecological and historical processes which they had described to me and which had made their farm into the unique place that it was. As a final consequence, uh, as the diversities of plants in meadow has become a policy issue to be counted, it means that farmer memories, their motivations, and their experiences get relegated to the private sphere as sort of individual concerns. The legislation did not address these attachments to place or their intimate knowledge of, of things like the uneven grazing uh, regimes. Farmer knowledge thus is not only illegible, but also reclassified as subjective. Um, and it favors, this favors the abstract features of land used to calculate uh, its agro-environmental value for, for giving payments rather than uh, as intimate places. And this is why farmers began to refer to these as maps from space uh, that, that had emerged in their land. To return then to uh, Costa Rica briefly, in Costa Rica, organic farmers had parallel types of uh, debates which, which were about, they were cacophonous debates about the harmonization of intellectual property rights on their, on their land, on, on their seeds. Uh, so one of the requirements for joining CAFTA was to sign the Union of Plant Variety uh, Protection Treaty and to create a new law on plant variety protection. This necessitates transforming seeds from the naturally and socially co-evolved and genetically mixed living beings that, that we heard about into genetically pure, individually created, legally protected, and globally tradable commodities. So Costa Rica had already passed a new organic law which protected farmers' rights to save simias criollas, but that law would be superseded by CAFTA, which had higher standing. And it, CAFTA required specifically adherence to the UPOV Treaty of the 1991 version. Um, and this allows uh, intellectual property rights to be registered on new plant varieties for 20 years, requiring farmers to obtain permission or provide payment uh, to the breeder in order to use the seeds of protected varieties. So in contrast to the Creole seeds that were protected by the national law, the required Upov Treaty uh, values genetic purity. And this is, a, this is a cartoon that was circulating where the farmer is surprised to find that his bean has become private property. Um, but so this was, these, these new varieties had to meet these criteria of distinctness, uniformity, and stability, which are almost impossible for farmer breeders like Pablo, who make their own varieties, to meet. Um, because farmers are selecting at the population level rather than at the variety level. But farmers may also um, allow these other crosses to occur, and thus these characteristics of uniformity and stability are undesirable as well. So they're not even looking for that in their, in their fields. The emphasis on purity in these, this new type of legislation, of course, is detrimental for biodiversity. It restricts the number of plants that can be marketed, and genetic erosion, particularly in Europe, has been targeted specifically to the effects of, um, it's been traced back to the effects of promoting laws like those in Upov. Uh, and modern breeding is relying less and less on, on old varieties, but using more of these elite materials. So it's actually producing uniformity rather than diversity. The way that the requirements were made also create a separation between farmers and breeders and the different types of knowledge that they 
have. Um, because in UPOV, it's possible to have a breeder's exception and a farmer's exception, which the country makes uh, to, to qualify uh, the effect. Costa Rica did, in fact, uh, create a farmer's exception for full-time smallholders, but they defined the category of smallholder in such a restrictive way where it was tied to their gross annual income from agriculture that should not be higher than the wages paid to a, a qualified generic laborer. So basically, it proletarianized farmers into laborers and meant that anyone making more money than an, than an average laborer would not qualify to get this, this exception. So it also redefined farmers completely economically rather than according to their, um, the processes in which they were engaged and meant that it was more of an exclusion of a large number of farmers rather than, than an exception for them. The, the other thing that's very important about the way these sorts of laws work is that the breeder's exception gives a very different set of rights to, to breeders than to farmers. Um, so the breeder's exception allows public access to reproduce seeds of protected varieties, um, but only to, uh, only to breeders and not to, not to farmers. So for research purposes, uh, these seeds become public access, whereas farmers are denied the very same rights to reproduce varieties um, because there's no such provision in the farmer's exception. So the way in which farmers who wanted to cross their own seed or with a protected variety like Pablo's parents had would become illegal and thus, or it would become illegal for them, not for the breeders. So what's in the public domain and free for the advance, advancement of knowledge for some becomes a criminal activity for others. This legislation thus redraws public and private domains and redefines what Ribot has called the bundles of power, which govern access to seeds as resources. So to, um, to summarize the, the ways in which these types of uh, legislation are creating these sort of conventional uh, types of wisdom, uh, there's again, similar, similar processes that we can see, which is that on the one hand, uh, there's a, an isolation of the properties of the resource which allow you to abstract it. You can abstract the land or abstract the seed from the network in which it was created and create a hierarchy and separation of the types of knowledge that are associated with these resources. Um, this thus alienates the, the things like the land or the seeds from these networked diversities out of which they've emerged. Farmers' knowledge thus also gets separated and subordinated to experts, either inspectors or breeders uh, in, in the two different cases. And the ways in which these policies were, uh, the policies were actually meant originally to uh, benefit farmers and yet they backfired in that in Latvia, the administration of EU support payments required that they give up some of what makes their farms meaningful places. And in Costa Rica, the designation of the farmer's exception was supposed to give them a space to get out of the problems caused by intellectual property rights, but did so in a way that redefined what farmers are and denied them the right to keep practicing the creolization of seeds. So in both cases, these are a conventionalization of diversity. So, to um, conclude, in both countries, farmers contested these changes in various more or less overt ways. And these are, um, in some cases, refusing to implement some of the regulations and being tried uh, for it through outspoken protests and referenda. Um, but I'm not going to go into those processes here. In all of these elements, however, we see that farmers are, in a sense, negotiating these spaces of organic sovereignties in relation to land, seeds, states, and markets. And these sovereignties are networked in that they're attempting to create and maintain relationships across scales rather than at various scales independently of one another. Nevertheless, these types of struggles for organic sovereignty are far from complete. And I don't mean to suggest that certification itself is some sort of solution, 
but rather that we have to think about how these institutional mechanisms uh, create spaces which allow certain types of negotiations to, to happen um, and may create more alternative spaces for networks in the, in the future. So in these, con con the, the way in which the constant struggles uh, continued can also give us a bit of hope. And I'd like to end with a quote from a farmer in Costa Rica who said, uh, all of us are in a struggle. And he raised his hands above his head to demonstrate, saying, in my thinking, I imagine the planet is sustained by many people holding it up. And I can't let my arms down because it will put too much load on the others. Even if it's sometimes difficult, even if I get tired, but no, it's better to keep holding it up. It's at least one important job we can all do together to sustain the planet. So, thank you.